Well, I apologize for interrupting your viewing. Um, do you want to raise a hand? Who wants to carry on watching Spaceballs? Oh dear, okay. Um, good afternoon, my name is Simon McCartney and today I would like to talk to you about a continuous delivery pipeline that we built to help deploy and maintain an infrastructure as a service OpenStack private cloud, which is a heck of a mouthful. There should have been two of us on stage today, uh, but one of my colleagues, Mick Gregg, decided to change employers at the very last minute and has been unable to join us. So I have to thank him for his hard work over the last several months on this project and for helping me prepare this presentation. Uh, thank you, Mick. So, a little bit of background. Um, this project predates HP Helion OpenStack, so this is not about a triple O deployment. We're using Ubuntu 12.04 as our base operating system, and we're using Ubuntu's OpenStack packages, and SaltStack for configuration management and orchestration. But that's largely irrelevant. Our real challenge was about building a pipeline that worked with packaged OpenStack and gave us an ability to build a multi-node uh, multi-node development environment that people could use on their own personal workstations. So hopefully many of these principles are transferable to whatever makes up your particular cloud ambitions. So let's start with the why. Why continuous integration and why continuous delivery and the pipeline that comes with the CI CD environment. Let's walk through some of the advantages that we saw from previous experience that motivated us to build a pipeline. Continuous delivery is a software deployment and development strategy that enables organizations to deliver features to users fast and efficiently. The core idea of CD is to create a repeatable, reliable, and incremental, incrementally improving pipeline for taking software con from concept to customer. Of course, configuration management is still software too. It wraps and coordinates your actual payload. In our case, an OpenStack environment built on Ubuntu and packaged OpenStack. The goal of continuous delivery is to enable a constant flow of changes into production via an automated software delivery pipeline. The continuous delivery pipeline is what makes all of this happen. Why? Infrastructure as code is better than infrastructure as art. Snowflakes are unique and beautiful things. Services built on Snowflake servers are bad. Snowflakes are especially bad when you're running a service that you know will span to hundreds or thousands of machines. By making your configuration management and deployment strategy part of a codified and enforced system, we are saying this is the way things will be. This is the way we will configure everything. It brings dependability and stability at the inconvenience of not just diving in and fixing things in production by hand. That stability comes from enforcing all changes through the same pipeline. All code and configuration changes go through the same test and deployment processes. Nothing jumps from a laptop to production reducing incidents due to environment configuration changes and getting rid of that, it worked on my laptop excuse. Having an automated, and, an automated build and deployment system also means that you have the ability to quickly build test systems to check urgent changes. None of the, oh crap, where can we test that for the latest bash exploit that's been discovered. Frequent small batches has many benefits. It forces you to automate everything out of sheer boredom and frustration at the very least. But when you provide frequent small changes, you have a much better chance of constantly improving your systems and procedures. Practice makes perfect. The Big Bang may have worked for the start of the universe, but constant evolution and improvement has worked much better for us since then. Frequent small batches also help decrease scrap work and rework due to long running patches. The quicker you can get something out into production, the quicker you're finished working on that particular project. Continuous delivery, we're going backwards, that was a test. <laughs> Removing the manual steps in a process can have many benefits. If you have to do something manually, invariably it is slower. It, automation allows you to reduce the time taken to complete a given set of steps and reduces the potential for user error. Of course, it's not all rosy. You now have to codify our processes and remove all of the tiny judgment calls that you make when you're working on a live system. However, the payoff for that is consistency and hopefully a faster cycle time, especially if we've just removed bottlenecks in manual processes, as manual processes are often tied to people or functional silos. Another advantage of having a proper pipeline is the ability to test everything. You can unit test at your smallest component level. You can do integration testing to make sure that your whole environment still works. You can do end-to-end -end testing so that the thing that you've just built with all of your configuration management still works as you expect. Once you have that reliable pipeline, you can then build in performance testing. We've built something with this new set of deployment modules. Does it work better? Does it work faster or slower than what we built previously? Were we expecting it to work faster or slower? Deployment tests. 
It's very easy to have a deployment system that forgets about how to build a system from scratch. If you put that into your pipeline, where you have to build from scratch on a regular basis, you never forget anything. You never, you, you're always ready to build from nothing. So you can, we can, with a good pipeline, we can test that you can do a clean build, that you can do an incremental upgrade, and that you don't forget anything in that process. Another, one of the challenges for configuration management is the separation of data and your code. So if you build a, your staging and test environments should be using the same code as, the re, as your production environments. However, they have different data on how those systems are configured. With our pipeline, what we've been able to do is build environments and build systems that allow us to validate the data that goes to build other environments. So in our pipeline, we can validate that the configuration data in for a production environment is actually, actually makes sense. So we can validate it before we ever hit production. So that's the data and the code being validated before we go anywhere. Now that we've outlined why we'd want to do a pipeline for configuration management, let's move on to how our pipeline works. So our pipeline is pretty typical for a private cloud implementation. We use vendor packages from Ubuntu. We use SaltStack for configuration management and orchestration. We're using Git, Garrett, Git Shelf, and Jenkins for our software engineering pipeline. We're using Test Kitchen to validate our configuration modules and our infrastructure engineering. In other words, how we build these personal development environments and how we build test environments are built on Vagrant, VirtualBox, and Public Cloud. So one of the nice things we've been able to do is use our own Public Cloud infrastructure to build test systems, build ephemeral test systems to validate everything in our pipeline. So hopefully none of this is too shocking. Um, we have a layered approach to how we work and how we build our system. Excuse me. We start with the configuration management modules that build your components. So we're using Salt, but this could equally be Chef cookbooks, Puppet modules, Ansible playbooks, whatever they are. Working on those individual components and being able to test those individual components individually and in their own right gives you a small, light framework to work in. So you can validate that your RabbitMQ cookbook or modules builds a RabbitMQ cluster consistently, that your Percona Galera cluster gets built consistently using your configuration management. Engineers can then use our personal development environment. This is the multi-node package-based OpenStack environment on your workstation. Another nice, easy name. So we've used Vagrant and VirtualBox to build a proper multi-node system. So we have uh, controller nodes, and we have compute nodes, and we have a, a nice diagram coming up on that. And that gives you a real-world environment, not DevStack. It's much more like production, which DevStack is nothing like. Um, so you can work on your individual configuration mon management module. Once you're happy with that change, you can then test it yourself inside your multi-node environment. Does it all still behave correctly? Right, now you're happy, push your review to Garrett. Garrett allows us to do two things. It allows us to push it for public review by your peers. Does this look good? Any comments and critiques on style? Is this the intent and is this understood by everybody? And it also then triggers Jobs and Jenkins to validate all of the changes. And those, the validation there happens at several levels. We can do individual module testing. So in this example, we're for a salt formula. Does it still behave the way the test spec that we wrote for this module expects? Um, we then build a a, a, more, a fuller system integration. Does this module, this change to this module, allow us to build, still build a system with the rest of the other modules? Our pipeline has several breaks in it. So we're at point four here. Um, our pipeline has several breaks in it of our choosing. We manually pick what versions of each modules go forward, and that's done in the deploy kit. The deploy kit tracks each repo and has a SHA-1 or a branch name for the particular version of a repo that you want to go into the deploy kit. Once the patch set on the deploy kit repo hits Jenkins, or a patch set on the deploy kit repo bumping a version for one or more of the configuration modules hits Garrett, Jenkins triggers a validation of that. Um, do we the SHA-1s listed there exist? Um, do the repos exist? Do we have access to these repos? Does it all still make sense? Once that passes and once it's been approved by your colleagues, in other words, the merge happens, we then build the deploy artifacts for this particular kit. 
So in our instance, or in our case, that's actually just a handful of tarballs. So tarball for each environment for stage and our production environments. And that tarball is then used to actually apply that deployment. Once the tarball is built, deploy, yeah, where are we? Seven, deploy toolkit kicks building the deploy artifacts, auto deploy to an ephemeral public cloud test environment. So I mentioned this earlier. This is where we take advantage of having a public cloud at our disposal, build a bunch of Nova uh, compute instances, a neutron network to wrap them, and build a OpenStack inside OpenStack to test out this configuration. Can all of the nodes still talk to each other? Does the RabbitMQ cluster get built correctly? Does the MySQL cluster get built correctly? Do we have the correct permissions on all of the database users? Do the, the various nodes have access to the database from the networks that they're connected to? That's all part of the validation of the deploy kit. Then we go on to the move deployment to the physical staging environment. And this is, for us, this is still a relatively manual process. We take the tarball, we use the scripts built inside that tarball. Once that passes all the validation tests, and we're ready to go. So I'm going backwards again. There we go. So I mentioned our personal development environment. Uh, we have three, what we call three control nodes or head nodes. In other words, the salt master, which is our configuration master, a controller, which is where our API and Nova API and Nova scheduler lives, and then our database roles. And then we have two compute nodes. And we just laid, this is laid out very similar to production for us, but it gives us, again, a multi-node environment to test all of the configuration management things that we've built. So the only, there's a couple of minor differences between this and production. Uh, in production, we span our, the, two, the database and the messaging cluster across a different set of nodes, but they're, they're still separate from the compute nodes. And this is just to reduce the instance count or reduce the virtual, box, virtual machine count that we need on a developer workstation to make this work. <laughs> well, there is a load balancer, but you can't see it. So this is, a, this is a single AZ with a single API server. However, there is a load balancer on each of the compute nodes for accessing the database server. Okay. But this, uh, from, from all intents and purposes, this is not fully load balances. The, in our environment, the load balancing across API servers is actually done at a level up from my engineering team. So it's done, the, the network engineering team do that with Netscalers. We just provide a set of API servers for them to touch. Okay, I'm going back into some of the how we validate changes and how we make sure that what we've just built actually works. As I said, we're using Garrett. This is the, this is our main code repository. It's how we get changes going into the code repository. It's how we get. It's how we. That's that's where everything lives. It's our host and review tool. We have that hooked up to Jenkins so that certain jobs get triggered on reviews landing and on re, on re merges happening. So reviews landing is when we do our preliminary validation. Does everything pass our test for this module? Um, do these various things exist in the configuration? And then on post-merge, we create the deploy artifacts. We take advantage of Test Kitchen to validate nearly all of our configuration management. Test Kitchen came out of the Chef community, but it's a very pluggable system. It allows us, we built a plugin for it called the called Kitchen Salt, which is a provisioner which allows us to use salt inside Test Kitchen. And what that allows you to do, or how many people here have used te Test Kitchen or are aware of Test Kitchen? A few. So Test Kitchen is a very nice framework for validating configuration management tools. Um, as I said, we've built Kitchen Salt, which allows us to test our salt environments. We then use some of the built-in testing frameworks. In particular, we're using server spec to say, okay, this salt state, or in chef, recipe, or puppets, module, or class. Um, we should have installed this package. We should configure this service. We should be listening on this port. You get to validate all of those inside Test Kitchen. And when you're working on a developer laptop, Test Kitchen runs with VirtualBox, or vir runs with Vagrant and VirtualBox. When we're using Test Kitchen from inside our Jenkins jobs, we then switch to using LXC, purely because it's lighter, and because our Jenkins slaves are running inside the cloud, so we need something that's not full virtualization to, to make that easier. So I mentioned briefly the deploy kit. Um, the deploy kit, uh, one of the tools inside it, Git Shelf, is what drives our entire configuration management, or an entire deployment system. So we're exceptionally cautious about what moves forward for full system integration and deployment. Instead of always working off master, we pick off, you know, we have this file here, Git Shelf, which tracks specific versions 
or branches of all of our repos. Each one of the repos up top here, for Kona, Rabbit, MQ, OpenStack, they're repos that configure specific uh, components inside our infrastructure. They're all pretty obvious. Um, but we pick off um, exact versions that we want to go forward. So the final step of any piece of work is the bit where you change Git Shelf to collect your changes. You can choose to run off master. Uh, Git Shelf fully supports that. Um, we're just very cautious about what moves forward. Git Shelf is a to tool that we wrote to do this. It's very similar to um, Librarian, Puppets, Burke Shelf, those kind of repo management tools. Salt doesn't have any kind of dependency management or any kind of um, yeah, module management for the configuration management. So we wrote this to try and fill that gap. It's, as I said, it's a mixture of Burke Shelf and the Android Open Source Project's repo tool. It just manages a collection of repos and lays stuff out on disk in a specific location. So that's where it'll end up in the tarball for the deployment. That's where it comes from. We can make sim links and a couple of other bits and pieces. We can do tokenization inside it to allow you to have the one configuration for different environments. I mentioned about creating ephemeral test environments. Um, to do that, we needed to be able to create a set of Nova instances uh, matching Nova network and router objects to allow the rest of our system to build out a, a system on top of that. And we do that with a tool called Contractor. And Contractor just takes a very simple JSON uh, definition of instances, excuse me, and networks. It's kind of like really, really, really super lightweight heat for environments where you don't have heat or you don't want to use heat. Um, I think everybody's written one of these. I mean, I, this is my third iteration of a tool that builds instances and networks in, in a coordinated fashion. So. Deployment automation. This is the final step, getting your actual code into production. We tend to move very slowly in where, continuation, where continuous integration and deployment for, an in, for a private cloud or for any type of a cloud is different from typical application. Continuous integration and deployment is you have very long running and potentially fragile systems that you can't change. So. A frequent CI CD deployment system is where you build a load of new instances and move traffic to those new instances in your cloud. When you are the cloud and you have people's instances running on your hardware, you can't do that. Everything has to stay running. So we tend to move very slowly in our deployments. We would move slowly across the clustered items, do one node of a cluster database at a time, make sure you haven't broken it, because if you break too many nodes in a cluster, the whole cluster breaks, um, which is rarely a good thing. And we also then move single AZ at a time, starting off with our lightest loaded AZ, start there and roll up through it again, single node at a time until we have confidence that things are actually working. Our deployment tooling takes advantage of our monitoring system so that whenever we apply a high state or make a change to one of the compute nodes or an API node or whatever it is, we then check in with our monitoring system. Is it all still OK? Are the checks fresh on it? Does it all look OK before we move on to the next one? Again, that's, to, that's the move slowly. Don't break everything at once approach. Um, we learned that the hard way. We broke everything at once, once, and it wasn't pleasant. Um, again, we're particularly cautious over some of the service restarts. Uh, Nova Network and Nova Compute, if they don't restart correctly, your, your environment can get very messy. Um, we have instances where or we've had incidents where Nova Network has not restarted, or sort of, you've done the restart, it seems to be going fine, it's still doing all its rebuilding, and then it fails somewhere on, later on, and you've already done another half dozen hosts or whatever. So that's a bit nice. Our next steps, so we're about 60% on getting that fully hands-free. Um, once we're completely hands-free for deployments, um, I want to stop having to do that by typing out a keyboard on a machine. Um, and I want to have it hooked in behind Rundeck, and optionally Rundeck then hooked up to GitHub, or not GitHub, Hubot, or some other chat operation tool that allows us to do deployments from a communal location. Everybody can see what's happening. Everybody can see how deployment happens. We have perfect timing or time keeping for when a deployment happens for any incident management. There are some links for some of the tools that we've used and some of the background reading for some of this. Uh, contractor and Git Shelf, some of the tools that we're using. And that all went very quickly. Any questions? There. I'll post these later if you, um, I think I have to post these later. <laughs> uh, you say you're using Ubuntu packaging. 
how you deal with extremely slow Ubuntu packaging. They simply cannot keep up with even upstream uh, OpenStack packages. And there is a serious bug fixes which take few months to be backported to stable version. How do you deal with that? If so, the question was about dealing with slow Ubuntu packaging. Um, Ubuntu packaging still moves faster than us for this particular private cloud. Um, we're still on Grizzly, so... Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Their packaging is perfectly fast enough as far as we're concerned. <laughs> so you never repackage Ubuntu packages? No, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, preface with what he just said. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you need some... Uh, pa patches perhaps applied that aren't yet merged or that haven't been approved yet upstream. Do you have any mechanisms for after deployment applying patches to up, up and sack? Yeah, so we, I think we've had to do that on maybe two occasions. Um, and what we've done is, it's not a particularly pleasant way of solving it. We deploy the package and then we deploy using salt, deploy the update over the top of it. So we literally update the, the Python script in place. So it's not great. We don't repackage it, but it we have the, the mechanism there to do that. Pardon? No, no, it's literally just drop the file on disk. <laughs> I didn't say it was nice. <laughs> it works, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but yes, you're right. But you, or you re end up reapplying it afterwards because it's part of your salt configuration management. Install this package. Once that package is installed, make sure this file looks like this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, was the use of Solstack a conscious sort of technical decision or uh, versus Puppet Chef whatever, or what was the It was a conscious technical decision made by not me. Um, it predates my... Which just has a historical it's, yes, it's story a historical behind it. Yes, it's <laughs> <laughs> a hor historical decision. Yes, sir. Um, you said the, the dev environments you used were rebuilding them uh, from scratch. Yes. Um, so the question was about rebuilding. We, we frequently rebuild dev environments on our laptops, but how, if we were to rebuild production, what would be involved? Um, some of that is out of our hands, usually the way that my organization works. We get physical hosts provisioned for us. They, get, uh, they come out of the, the internal provisioning system with Ubuntu already on them and enough configuration for Salt to take over. And that's where our Salt stuff takes over. We have a... We have a a state that we apply to configure some low-level networking. We do a restart, and then we do a high state against them in a coordinated fashion. So high state to build the rabbit cluster, build the database cluster. Then we do the rest of the OpenStack install, and then we do the compute nodes. So. This is Grizzly, so this is all Nova. Uh, it's Nova for, again, <laughs> historical reasons. Um, this environment was built about nearly two years ago, um, I think. Uh, I'm only on the project about a year. Hi, uh, I'm going to talk in the mic, not to have to talk so loud. But um, on your physical nodes, when you yep. deploy to that, uh, when you test on that, I guess, um, let's say you're testing some sort of a, an upgrade, it fails for whatever reason, how do you bring your physical nodes back to the prior state? Uh, rollbacks are always tricky because a certain state has changed. Um, because of the way our deployment artifacts are built, we can roll back to the previous version of the deployment system. So that will take back certain configuration files or you know, the delta between those two deploys. Um, so it all depends on the deploy uh, and what was involved in that. If there was a database migration, currently we don't support rollback. We don't have any way of rolling back a database migration. Um, but for configuration changes on you know, nova.conf and things like that, that's just roll back to the previous version and a high state in our state, in our case. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're doing something very similar, uh, deploying from packages, uh, but uh, we sometimes hit this problem that we have some old version like Havana, and we put some patches on top and would like to upstream them, but we don't have a simple way to uh, test them or master. So do you hit this problem and do you have some solution? Uh, so these are packages that you've these are, um, what, what, what package updates? These are a, a, an incremental update to one of your OpenStack packages, or? Yeah, like a bug fix uh, on some old version of OpenStack releases. Uh. 
Well, yeah, if you're, I mean, so we pinned to specific package versions. Um, so if we wanted to test, you know, version uh, version two of something, it's a matter of pinning or putting that in the repo that we're using for this deployment. So I'm not, I'm not sure that really answers your question. We do. It's not, it's not a scenario that we have to cater for very much. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. We have so so the question was about using Vagrant OpenStack instead of using Vagrant VirtualBox. Um, the issues with Vagrant OpenStack is it doesn't really do great networking support. So our dev environment. No, oh, there we go. Too far. Um, we build the dev environment out with three networks. So there's the standard NAT network that comes with all Vagrant. VirtualBox instances, and then we build out two host networks, one separate IP ranges, and they are what we actually use uh, to, they emulate our production networks. Um, so there are IP ranges that are in our control, we have communication between the different nodes. Uh, the Vagrant OpenStack plugin doesn't really have great support for that. It gets, or it didn't when we looked at it last. Yeah, and that's, and, and whenever we go to build the ephemeral um, test environments, we kind of ditched Vagrant altogether and just went straight to talking to the Nova and Neutron APIs to create instances. And you know, once we have a set of instances that we can SSH onto to do the salt payload, um, we're happy. Yes, sir? How do you find salt as a configuration management tool? So the question is, how do we find salt as a configuration management tool? Um, it's interesting. So I, d I, I did Puppet for three or four years. I did a year of Chef and then moved on to a salt project. Um, the greatest thing about Salt for us was that it has the distributed execution built in. Um, it's just there. It's not, not um, Collective bolted on afterwards or Chef push. It's just there, and that was the greatest thing. Um, it's sometimes tricky to get your head around the... the <laughs> so the, it's great that the, the separation of code and data is harder in Salt because everything's data. So your Salt states are actually just data about what you want to do. It doesn't even look or feel like code in any shape or form. Um, it's just data, so it's all YAML. So it's YAML for, for your, state, your, code, your states, which are code, and it's also YAML for your salt pillars, which are your data. So that separation is a bit harder to get your head around. And the template, templating language that you use with salt, uh, Jinja, or Jinja2, is very fragile in places. And in early versions of salt, um, you got very, very poor reporting on where the problem actually was. It literally, you got a stack trace that said, Ginger was bad, right? Well, that, uh, there's 32 ginger files in this state. Which one was it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> has that improved? It has, yes. So yeah, it, salt has been getting much, much better. Yeah. So we've we've had two approaches to that. One is where um, we attempt to build out a, an ephemeral environment that actually has the same IP ranges as production. And Neutron allows you to do that. You say, I want these IP addresses and that work and that network. And they could be, they're completely made up. So we completely make them up to match another environment. And we say, all right, you know, they're all still talking because um, all of those IP addresses valid or match. Um, and we have a project we haven't quite finished where uh, we're kind of doing it, where it's, you define a pillar template or a, a set of required um, pillar variables as, the, as what's required for each state, each package. And we say, OK, um, load in that YAML file. Does it have all of these things defined? No, it doesn't. You know, that's, that's literally just, is it defined? And the other approach we had to that is every state should actually work without pillars. So it defaults to something sensible. Now, that something sensible is just so that it doesn't blow up, it'll be completely wrong for a production environment, or you know, if it's a if it's a changing thing, it'll be completely wrong for a production environment. But we we default all salt states to use something sensible for on-off values for you know thresholds. Okay, thank you. You say you're using Grizzly. When you plan to upgrade, and where you're gonna upgrade, and how you're gonna do this in this 
Схем, thank you. Especially, uh, especially I want to hear how you're gonna transit from Nova net Network to Neutron. So eBay had a great talk this morning on how they transitioned from Nova Network to Neutron. Um, they had a very, very nice process, and they, I think they reckoned they demoed having sub-second downtime. So they, they built up an entire, in their instance, it was a, an entire Havana stack. They did the database migration, and then it cut over time. It was literally turn the network off, unplug um, the bridge, and plug it into um, open vSwitch. For us, um, our solution is a slightly different. This w is an environment that is supposed to be short-lived, which is why I'm now, we're now in year two, because it's a short-lived environment. Um, but the internal tenants are moving elsewhere, so we're not <laughs> upgrading. <laughs> we're, we're moving the tenants out to a new environment, and then we're shutting this one down. <coughs> yes, I mean, that, so one of the things that we've um, tried to be able to do is build out the current version of something and do the upgrade. And for us, that's for us, that's largely been about um, changes in our configuration management and very, very small gri grizzly changes, so still on grizzly. Um, but in whole upgrades like that, it, it should be possible, yes. Um, because we, one of the things, so we, have a, we have an interesting network set up. Um, one of our, our migration process involves uh, bridging or getting rid of three separate networks and replacing with one. And that's one of the reasons we built this environment, why we put so much effort into it to try and undo that. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>